A new day, a new Python release, and my word, what a release it is. Python 3.12 is packed full of improvements and new features, so I've scoured around and picked out the most important things you need to know. I normally aim for five minutes and undershoot when I've done these before, but I imagine I'll probably be making up for that this time as there is a lot to talk about. So I suppose let's not waste any time. Let's start with the big one, shall we? Python speed, or supposed lack thereof, has always been at the center of arguments made by its detractors, though many steps have been taken lately to improve the situation. Python 3.11 brought in optimizations to interpret a startup, and of course a specialized adaptive interpreter, but 3.12 is going a step further in laying the groundwork for proper multi-core support. This has been a long time coming, quite literally, actually. In fact, support for multiple interpreters, the crux of this endeavor, has been around since 1997, that was before I was born. When it was originally implemented, all interpreters in the same process needed to share a single global state protected by the global interpreter lock, or the GIL for short. The GIL greatly improved Python's single core performance at a time when multi-core computations were much less of a thing, though it has since grown to draw the ire of many due to the devastating effect it has on these newfangled multi-core operations. It's only now that a solution has been devised that allows us to keep the single core gains of the GIL while also providing true multi-core support a per-interpreter gil. Having a separate state, and therefore a separate gil, for every interpreter means that interpreters don't have to wait for a global state to be unlocked before accessing it. Some data will still be stored in a global state, though this data will exclusively consist of anything that isn't subject to race conditions, such as immutable objects and objects guaranteed to only be modified in the main thread. Memory is still a concern, you know. A Python API interface for creating and managing interpreters won't be with us until Python 3.13, there are C API interfaces available now for those that want to get stuck in. The idea is that the new interpreters module will sit alongside threading, async and multiprocessing, aiming to be useful in ways the others aren't. I'll be making a video in the coming weeks about the plans for Python 3.13 though, so you'll have to watch that if you want to know more. Wink wink. The per interpreter gil is not the only performance improvement Python 3.12 brings. Far from it, in fact. The tokenized module is now up to 64% faster due to changes I'll be discussing later. The re.sub and .subend functions are now between two and three times faster for replacement strings containing group references, and is instance checks against runtime checkable protocols are now anything up to 20 times faster. 20 times! The async OO module has also been at receiving end of a number of major speedups, including the introduction of eager task factories and a C implementation of the current task function, which provide anything up to five and six times speedups respectively. When combined with other new optimizations, the async OO module could run anything up to 75% faster. Sweet. Syntactic formalization of f-strings is another major change in 3.12, which lifts some of the more useless restrictions imposed by the LL1 parser. This parser was replaced by a new peg parser in Python 3.9, which added a level of consistency to parsing and significantly reduced maintenance costs in the process. F-strings have not been able to take advantage of this parser until now, and now they have a clearly established formal grammar, other Python implementations, such as PyPy, can take advantage of the increased consistency. These changes are also responsible for the tokenized module speedup. And we're back to speedups again. Mind you, I'm not complaining. On to typing improvements now, and probably the biggest story here is one I've managed to miss completely until now, a new type parameter syntax. The specifying of type parameters in Python has felt bolted on, their words not mine, especially when it comes to generic or covariant class declarations. The new specification provides a formalized syntax for these classes, as well as for functions and type aliases, which provides a much cleaner interface for defining type parameters. The syntax also contains support for variadic types, protocols, and constraint types. An override decorator has also been introduced, which tells type checkers that the decorated method is specifically designed to override a method in the base class, rather than function as a standalone thing. This in turn will allow type checkers to warn you if refactors in base classes, such as renaming or deleting of methods, are likely to break functionality in child classes. Many other popular languages, including C++ and TypeScript, already have similar mechanisms, and the functionality has actually existed as a third-party library for some time. This change just brings it all into the standard Python ecosystem. TypeDict is getting another update, this time related to precise quags typing. There isn't actually Actually anything new going on here, as the unpacked type central to this was introduced last time around. However, the type has been cleverly reused to provide a mechanism to accurately type in expected keyword arguments. This can additionally be used in conjunction with the not required type, also added in 3.11, to represent quags that don't need to be provided at all. Before we get into some very important deprecations and removals, there's just enough time to play our new quiz. Double standards! Here are the rules. I'll read out a question about something that's new or changed in the standard library module, and you tell me which module I'm talking about. Ready? Okay. Question one. Which module is getting a new batched function? That's right, it's itatools. 
the function will be able to accept an iterable and split it into batches of a given length. Neat. All right, question two. Which module is getting improved Windows support? Right again, it's OS. The list drives, list volumes, and list mounts functions are being added, and the stat and lstat functions are getting updated to be more accurate. Mega. Okay, question three. Which module is getting new walk functionality as well as improved glob support? Wow, you're on a roll. It's pathlib. Path and pure path objects are now able to be subclassed. Swish. Okay, question number four. Which modules are getting new command line interfaces? You're unstoppable. It's SQLite 3 and bizarrely UUID. Because why not? Okay, okay, quieten down. It's the final question. Which module will now automatically select the best child watcher? Curveball, it's a Cinco. In fact, that's one of the optimizations I talked about earlier. How about that? And with that, we come to the end of our first and only installment of Double Standards. If you got all five questions correct, let me know in the comments and don't lie or I will come to your house. Thanks for playing. <coughs> wow, that was interesting. Anyway, uh, deprecations and removals. There's actually quite a few important ones to go over. The distutils module is gone and neither setup tools nor ensure pip will be installed in virtual environments by default anymore. The idea behind all that is that you should use the import lib module instead especially as its predecessor, the imp module, is also being removed this release. Additionally, wstring attributes have been removed from Unicode objects, reducing the size of string objects by at least 8 bytes, and support for loads of legacy web browsers is being removed from the web browser module, including Firefox 35 and Netscape Navigator. Come on guys, I only died 15 years ago, you've got to give me some time. As far as deprecations go, support for extracting tar file archives without specifying a filter argument will be removed in Python 3.14 as a reaction to recently unearthed security concerns. Data will become the new default value from then. And UTC based functions like UTC now will be removed from the date time library. You'll need to switch to using time zone aware objects exclusively, but a removal version for this hasn't been set, so you still have plenty of time. Whew. Wow, that was a lot. We even managed to fit a quiz in there. Python 3.12 has really shaped up to be one hell of a release with so many cool improvements and new features. I can't wait to properly dig into it. Let me know in the comments below what you're most excited for in this release and subscribe if you want to be the first to see more detailed videos on specific features in 3.12 as well as the video I'm making covering plans for Python 3.13 all coming in the next few weeks. See ya!